you're very rarely ever going to get away from tubes, so no matter what your methodology is that you might possibly use in your blood bank, there will be tubes around and you will have a necessity to use them on occasion. We have instrumentation in blood bank. Um, most of the time the instrumentation is just application of either the MTS gel system or agglutination or solid phase or some combination thereof. So it's, when you get into the hospitals, if you start off in chemistry and then you go to the blood bank, you'll think the blood bank instrumentation is pretty lame. Um, when you, if you start off in the blood bank, you'll think it's pretty whiz bang. So you get to chemistry and then you'll think, ooh, the blood bank is pretty, pretty rudimentary. But um, it, micro and blood bank were probably the last two to really get to the point of having a lot of instrumentation and you'll still go into some labs that they won't have any instrumentation because everything is going to be manual. There's a lot of manual hands-on. So, this is what we call the MTS gel system. <laughs> okay, so it was um, developed over in Europe and then it was brought into the United States. They have other companies, This particular company is Ortho. Um, Ortho was the one that brought it into the United States originally. The patent on the technology has expired, so now you see other manufacturers producing similar setups. Griffles, for instance, has a gel card like these, but it has eight wells, which I think is kind of funny because you really don't need eight wells, but it's pretty big in particular. But, um, so you'll see other, other companies that will be making them now. Once upon a time, you all only saw them distributed through Johnson & Johnson slash ortho. But now you'll, you'll have other companies with other instrumentations and other gel cards that look similar. Um, the ABD cards look very familiar. You can see the blue and the yellow like you can for everything else. That's A and B. Over here and over here. Okay. Do I need to get away, give you a black background, whatever. Um, okay, so you have anti-A in this first well, anti-B in the second well, anti-D in this third well. Then you have basically your, um, we were talking about earlier, just inert protein concentration, probably about a, a 6%. So you run that as a control. And then you have two empty wells to use as your reverses. So this is what you would use if you were using this technology. I'll tell you, most of the time, if you're doing these manually, you're not going to use these cards. They're relatively expensive, and it takes longer than you would really have wanted for them to take in order to do an ABO. But if you are using the instrumentation that they use that warrants these cards, you would use them. So you, would, you may have them for your instrument, but not for your manual station. There's a polyacrylamide gel in the bottom. So if you guys can see the opaque area in the bottom, that's where the antigen antibody gets hung up once it reacts up in the polyacrylamide gel. It's kind of easier to see. This is an IgG card. And if you look, <laughs> is that better? If you look, you can see the polyacrylamide gel at the bottom that's opaque and across the top there's a clear line, that's your list. Okay. So what happens is you put your screen cells, and I'm gonna have to go get some because that was the one thing I forgot to put out. You put your screen cells in, you put your um, plasma in on top of this, you incubate it, you spin it down. If an antigen and an antibody bind, they get hung up in that polyacrylamide gel. If they bind, you know, there's a lot of agglutination, a four plus sits on top of it and then there's varying degrees of agglutination within the polyacrylamide gel. If it's negative, they all sink to the bottom and you have a button at the bottom. So it's pretty cool. They will tell you that it's much more um, streamlined as far as being able to um, standardize when you use gel as opposed to tubes. If you do a positive screen and you want somebody to see it, it's very hard to preserve that positive screen and let somebody else look at it later, whereas with these, there's a foil coating at the top. You can slop a piece of tape over the top of it and it'll preserve until it starts to evaporate. But as you can tell, there's very, very small volumes associated with this. So you can't leave it open for very long because it will evaporate. 
So if you hold that thought right now, I'll be right back. To using three to five percent cell suspension for our tube testing in the gels we use a 0.8 percent cell suspension so basically these are the same reagents that you're used to seeing they're a1 cells and b cells but they're a much weaker concentration because we're going to use them in the gel okay and here again like anything else you want to make sure they're always suspended now the one thing that you're going to be really happy to know is there's no washing involved in <laughs> this system and there's no check cells. Everything gets hung up in the polyacrylamide gel so you don't have to do that. When we first went from tubes to um, the gel, we always felt like we were forgetting to do something because it, there are fewer steps. Okay, so that is my A and B cells. These are the screen cells that we talked about this morning to do the antibody screen. particular set of one, two, and three. Okay. They too are 0.8%. This is the anagram that comes with each individual lot number and it will tell you which ones of the cells are positive for which ones of the antigens. So this is a very important piece of paper to have when you're doing an antibody screen because if it's negative you really don't care much but if it's positive this is going to be a big clue as to what your identity of your antibody could possibly be and that's the name of the game that's what we're basically doing um, so having the right lot number that associates with those screen cells is really really important because there's going to be a lot of similarities from lot number to lot number for instance Typically, screen cell one is an R1R1, screen cell two is an R2R2, and screen cell three is a little R, little R cell. But you may get a manufacturer who wants to mix it up a little bit and be different, and there is one out there. Uh, and so you want to make sure that you know what you perceive to be correct is correct if you, you're dealing with your antibody identification. The other thing is, remember, these come from people. These are not artificially made. So this was a donor once upon a time. And so they're going to have different setups. You know, the number one may be homozygous for big K, and um, number three may be um, homozygous for, say, big S, whereas the next lot number, that may not necessarily be true. So even though one, two, and three are always R1, R1, R2, R2, and little r, little r, the other antigens vary. And you need to make sure that you have the right lot number. This has messed up more than one um, budding blood banker in their, in their quest to find an antibody because they had the wrong anagram to go with the cells that they were working with. So you need to make sure that that's happening. Okay. This is the pipetter that goes with it. The pipetter has channels that are useful for what we need so we can change the volumes and then it's you know multi dispense for the same volumes uh, we use 50 microliters we use 25 microliters primarily those two and then you do on occasion we'll use a 12.5 microliter so we have them all here so we don't have to go hunt um, pipetters up so what i typically do first because it requires incubation, is I'm gonna do my screen first. Okay, so I'm gonna make sure that my cells are suspended from the bottom. Now, so there are six wells and we have three cells. So all I need are three wells. So these other ones can just ride along and then I can use them for somebody else later on but I don't want to open them up and leave them exposed to the air because then that's going to dry out the list and the gel and it's going to make them worthless to use. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull the first three wells open and cut off the foil. 
so that I have my three wells accessible. Um, today's theme are child actors. I have Eve Plum here. Does anybody know who Eve Plum is? Yeah. Am I dating myself badly? I've had she was more, she was Jan Brady. <laughs> so we're dealing with Eve Plum. So I'm going to write her name here. Off and I'll write her name here. Now, what you have been basically instructed to do is always put the clear stuff in first, but when you're dealing with this particular methodology, that's not what you want to do. You want to do the exact opposite of what your inclination is. And the reason for that is if you put your you put your plasma in first and it has antibodies and then you put your cells. The line where they touch, you might get some antigen antibody reactivity, but you're not gonna have maximum antigen antibody reactivity for what you're testing for. So what's gonna happen is while it's incubating, you'll, they'll react. And then when you put it in the centrifuge, the antibodies are gonna go boop, and the cells are gonna go boop, and you have a false negative. Whereas if you put your cells in first, then you put the antibody containing plasma in on top of it, it's going to have the possibility of floating through the cells and reacting. And then when you centrifuge, it's gonna have another opportunity to be able to react before it hits the bottom and you get a false negative. So when you're dealing with gel, you wanna put your cells in first as opposed to your um, plasma. So we're gonna put 50 microliters of our cells. I'm gonna start off with number one. So it has this little silver thing on the side. You're going to draw up, you know, not a ton, but all the way to, to this little shoulder area. This fits the first little back in. It has a pretty large dead area, dead space, so you can't really drain it dry like you can some pipettes. Um, and I'll show you that in a minute. What you want to do is you don't want to stick your pipette all the way in there and get it contaminated and you don't want to hang out here so high that you splash it everywhere. The easiest thing to do is put your finger over the other well, slide the tip down so it's just inside the micro well, and then dispense. Then you can, as long as you haven't contaminated the tip, you can run it into the, back into the bottle. So let me show you if I'm gonna to continue to dispense. There's your dead space. So if you get too close to that, you're gonna be dispensing nothing near 50 microliters. So the silver thing, you run it back in, close it off. If you push the silver button all the way, then the tip pops out. Which one is that one that you put in there? This is number two. So that was number one, this is number two. And after you get really good at it, you don't have to finger there, but not a bad idea. Until you get really comfortable. So if I were doing multiple patients, I could put three here and three there and then wait for my plasma. One where it needed to go. Okay, so I have 50 microliters of my cells. This pipe header doesn't get used very often because it's very, very tight. Whereas the ones at the hospital are well worn and walk around a lot and sometimes do caresses and all kinds of other things. Okay, so I'm going to go into my plasma. I'm going to draw up some of my plasma to sense the first little bit back. This is 25 microliters. The okay. first one was 50, 50. and now mm -hmm. it's 25? Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to dispense 25 into each one of my wells. Okay. Then I'm going to take my gel card and I'm going to incubate it in this heat block which is 37 degrees it should be 35 to 39 and it's going to go for 15 minutes okay. so in the meantime while that's going we're going to do Eve's blood type okay. so I'm going to go ahead and open this because this is only good for one patient so in keeping with our usual, we're going to go back to 50 microliters. 
And I have all this written down for you guys, so I guess I should have that. Um, <laughs> so you don't have to take too many copious notes. All right, so I'm going to put A1 cells in the first blank well, and that's 50 microliters. Switch this to 25. I'll take my plasma. It's going to overflow. Oh, no. Put 25 in there and there. Okay. Then I'm going to flip it and leave it at 25. This is our diluent, which is sort of like saline. Down into my cells. I'm gonna, you're right, it's gonna overflow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, backup plan. I'm gonna take 25 microlayers of my pack cells. And I'm going to put that in with my 50, uh, with my um, 0.5 ml of my diluent. I usually put it going down the side, and that's a Myra thing. And the reason I do that down the side is sometimes you get more cells than plasma when you go down into the, um, the sediment. Other times you get more plasma than you really wanted, and so sometimes you need a little bit more than you bargained for. But... Um, this way you can kind of play with it and adjust your concentration a little bit. So what you're doing is you're making a, you're making a what should be a three to five percent cell suspension. Okay. So you flip in your flip in your um, center, your pipette to twelve point five. You know I take my three to five percent cell suspension. I'm going to put twelve point five in the A, B, D, and the control. Go ahead and put it in the control because if you need the control, it's there, you might as well. But it's not really necessary in most cases. Although they do tell you from ortho that they like to have a control with all of the patients just in case you have some kind of a fibrin. So you have your cells. We've got our A and B cells and our plasma for our reverses. We've got our screen incubating. So what I'm gonna do with this is I'm gonna come over here this is the centrifuge that goes with the gel workstation. And if you look, it has little slots in it, just like it has little slots in the incubator. So I'm going to put this in. And I'm going to have to suck it up and use a, a balance because you can't spin just one. Sort of a potato chip. Right? So put this in. Like that. So as long as you don't have anything in them, you could spin these cards as many times as you really want. There's nothing that's going to hurt them. In fact, the company um, came in one time and told us if for some reason you laid them on the counter like that or like that, now there's such a small volume, the lists will run up into the foil and then they won't work very well. Eventually they'll dry out, but the company had told us that you could just stick them in the centrifuge and spin them and as long as they looked you know, the, the pristine condition that they should look, then you can go ahead and use them. Although then they came back later and said, oh no, we really didn't officially say that. But I think somebody must have had problems with it and then here they go back and say, oh, well, we were told you could do that. All right, so I'm gonna put this in. I'm gonna shut it. I'm gonna hit start. If it's plugged in, it be plugged in. This is gonna be set up. Jordan was my chemistry professor. This thing doesn't work. It's usually not plugged in. Okay. All right. So, have the power on. I'm going to hit it. 
It should lock and you hit start. Okay, it's preset to 10 minutes. The RPMs should be somewhere between 870 and 920. If they're not, there's no way that you can really adjust it. The only way you can do to fix that is to have somebody come in and actually take the thing apart and try to adjust the RPMs. So really and truly, the RPMs should work fine. We're going to get Greg to do it. Yeah. <laughs> Great, come take it apart. Mm -hmm. um, it's 904, so if you're out, you're in luck, you don't have to take it apart for us. You're in good shape. So it's going to take 10 minutes for that. That's going to incubate for another 8 minutes and 51 seconds. So what's going to happen when this pops, I'll pull it out and show you what it looks like because you don't need to stand here for 10 more minutes. And then when that timer goes out, as soon as this one's finished, I'll take those cards over and put that card in here so we can see what the, the screen looks like. Timing is not terribly critical. You want the cards to incubate for at least 15 minutes. They can go probably to 35, and like I said, it's not so much because of the time, but because of the warmth and the volume that you've got in your gel cards that you can have evaporation, and then you can have false negatives or false positives because you've got you know, crusty polyacrylamide gel. So. Um, if you leave that in, once the timer goes out, you don't have to jump over there and immediately stick it in. It's not like it's, you know, gonna blow up and have smoke everywhere. But um, so once that happens, and then I'll walk around and show everybody what it looks like, and I will move that so you don't have to look at it. And um, that is Jill. What I would like to do at some point in time because the class is so large, it's kind of hard with one workstation to let you come over and do your screen, but we have a couple of labs that are relatively short. So when we do one of those shorter labs, anybody who wants to come and you know try this out, we certainly have that capability so you can have um, the experience of using the pipetter and spinning the cards and that sort of thing. It's not really terribly difficult. Uh, that's the joy of it. But at least this way, when you go into the hospitals and they say, oh, have you ever seen gel? You can say yes. And then when they say, have you ever used it? You can say uh, minimally, but yes. So, you know, you can't say, oh, I've never, this is something I don't know anything about. Because you've seen it, right? Okay. And it's on video. And it's on video, yes. Mm -hmm. We have proof. <laughs> All right. So, that's it. Everybody has a couple of, of patients. And so we're going to do 